Thanks for joining us. In case you have noticed our surroundings, we're live at the 1836 Crosby House, having the chance to discuss the most recently completed legislative session with longtime Vermont State Senator Vincent DeLuzzi from Essex Orleans County. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, Tim, thank you, and great job you did during Tropical Storm Irene. We, of course, uh, heard about it at the State House and uh, passed a resolution recognizing your work and the work of your radio station, so thank you. You're very welcome. Vermont broadcasters, as well as legislators, are all doing what's best for the state, and in times of trouble, we all chip in to be able to make sure we can be as whole as possible again. To that end, there's been a number of matters brought up in the wake of Tropical Storm Irene and uh, looking at some of the economic development concerns. And I guess first one I'd speak of is mobile homes. What have you and others been able to do to help out in the wake of problems with the storm and uh, people and organizations that are struggling to get themselves back on their feet? Well, uh, when one of the things we learned uh, from previous uh, flooding, previous disasters that we've experienced is really that we should stay out of the way during the acute period following the event. And those of us in the northern part of the state, I live on the Canadian border, uh, were not adversely impacted like you were down here in Wyndham County. And so the best thing we could do during the six months following the storm was really to stay out of the way, but we did monitor things. When we returned to the State House in early January, uh, my committee, which is the, the Commerce Committee of the Senate, it's known as the Senate Economic Development Committee, I said, you know, if there's a dis disproportionate impact of this storm, it's on low-income people who live in mobile homes, which parks are located in, by and large in flood zones, and that we really needed to focus our attention on passing a comprehensive mobile home bill, which is what we did. And then, uh, in March, on March 30th, at the request of Senator Peter Galbraith, who serves as a member of my committee, we held the second hearing here in Wyndham County, in Brattleboro, and had a chance to meet the folks at Tri-Park, where we learned of the devastation and the significant financial impact on the revenues and resources of that community. And so, as a result of all of that information, we passed a bill known as S-99, which uh, addressed not only the acute needs of Tri-Park and other mobile home parks that were adversely impacted by the tropical storm, but also passed the most comprehensive mobile home legislation in Vermont's history. And it provides, uh, essentially, uh, mobile home owner rights it facilitates the development of additional mobile homes, mobile home parks, which really are the most affordable form of housing in Vermont. It also provides relief to TriPark in that it uh, defers almost $500,000 in interest and principal payments, which would have started this summer uh, to help pay for the new water and sewer infrastructure that they placed at the park. So the bill really was the right thing to do at this time. So does this mean we're going to see additional mobile home parks across the state and uh, how important are they to our overall housing mix? Well Vermont ha 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 in comparison to other parts of the country has very high uh, cost of housing. Mobile home parks, uh, and a lot of it's historic, and a lot of it's no longer relevant as a result of Act 60 passed in 1997, but there's still a belief in some communities that mobile home parks are a drain on the resources of the community, a lot of kids coming to the school system, and uh, they're simply not welcome. What this legislation says is that communities, municipalities, planning commissions, zoning boards, select boards can no longer discriminate on land use decisions when someone wants to build or expand a mobile home park. The laws uh, prior to this bill, which was signed into law on Monday, the law was that you cannot discriminate against individuals based on poverty and a number of other protected categories. But there was never a law in the books that said that a community could not discriminate against the development of a mobile home park. 
because there are no individuals living in the park before it's built. And so this bill overcomes that hurdle. And we're hoping that when someone now proposes an affordable housing project in the form of a mobile home park, that if the law is followed, and of course if it's not, it'll be enforced, there will be a better reception among municipal officials. Once Act 60 passed, uh, the burden of educating students has really shifted to the state. Uh, there's a grant per student, there are adjustments for the size of school and other modifications. So the fear that mobile home parks generated decades ago no longer exists. So we're hoping a combination of those factors will lead to more affordable housing for in the form of mobile home parks. Has there been so-called uh, snob zoning to try to shut mobile home parks out? I think it was in the past. We've addressed zoning in the past to, to deny the ability to simply zone out mobile home parks, but there was no requirement that they approve them uh, because the only prohibition was discriminating against individuals. So I'm hoping that uh, that this moves forward. The other thing we said put in the bill was we put a, a 1.5 million dollars to assist in mobile home ownership and mobile home park development. And one of the issues that we learned about was that, that most mobile homes are in flood zones. And so we want to see if there's any way to try to migrate those into safer locations that would be less prone to be hit by a disaster like Tropical Storm on Irene. In fact, that is still the case at Tri Park in Brattleboro, especially one of the uh, parks in particular, the Glen Trailer Park, which was the worst hit uh, in Tropical Storm Irene. Some serious decisions about what you do with the property, what you do with uh, uh, someone's place to live, and most importantly, who's going to write the check? Right. Well, another thing we did during the bill was we included a provision which uh, it, retroactive to January 1, 2012, because we did have some damage that was caused in the spring prior to the tropical storm in late August. Uh, what, what the legislation did is it, direct, it, it gave specific authority to municipal officials and others to condemn a piece of property. FEMA has been, you know, FEMA has not been the easiest organization to deal with. In fact, you know, they come with their trailers and their trucks and their PR people, and when it's all said and done, they leave you with a stack of papers, which if you manage to get through it, you might get something, probably not. And that's why we had to use state resources really to provide that immediate interim relief. But uh, anyway, they, they, they said no one in Vermont had the authority to condemn a mobile home or a home to write, literally write a letter saying this property is condemned. We included a provision in S-99 that retroactive to January 1, 2012, authorized the governor and a number of municipal officials to condemn a property, which will result in a check to that property owner of $30,200. So if you're a mobile home owner and your property was totally destroyed, you will now be able to uh, have a municipal official or even the governor write a condemnation letter and they will send you a check for $30,200. Now what happened was FEMA monitored the legislation. They knew we were going to do it retroactive and retroactive legislation can be passed. We were prepared to do it and they finally threw the towel in and said uh, we're going to uh, authorize the governor to write a letter of condemnation. So the problem then was well what about the homes that have already been removed? and they said they would rely on photographs and other information from municipal officials. So that was a major stroke of business for the individuals who lost their homes. In fact, we're gonna to go to uh, Glen Park uh, later this morning and make that announcement together with uh, the announcement that we're deferring almost $500,000 over the next two years so they can get their back on their feet and uh, re replenish their resources so that they can make those payments. One of the things I've been struck with, as I've driven across the state of Vermont, not only are we very, very resilient in the face of this storm and in the face of other uh, issues, including the downtown fire in Brattleboro, but there is still a lot of flood-related devastation and uh, people who think that A, government will solve everything, or B, that it will happen overnight, have to think again, um, you know, will this uh, legislation give 
perhaps enough of a bridge for people who are really in need right now? Right. Well, uh, I think there's a lot of disappointed people in FEMA. Uh, and, and there is no interim relief. In fact, they're simply still getting around to deciding what they're going to pay and what they're not going to pay. I toured Flat Street last night with a group of people. And the fact that any for-profit business really received zero assistance, and even the Latches Theater itself, in which uh, then Senator Shumlin and I helped to facilitate the purchase from the Latches family and converted it into the Latches uh, Performing. At that time, we were going to call it the Southeast Vermont Performing Arts Center. It's since evolved and has a different name, but in any event, uh, they are for tax reasons, still uh, a for-profit corporation, suffered a lot of damage and received no funding from FEMA, which uh, I really think is just just outrageous. So we're, we've, we've set aside some money in the budget this year. This is an additional $100,000 to assist in counties that were not declared federal disaster areas. And so we're going to see if we can uh, come up with some funding to help there. There's also going to be a hearing on June 5th which is to uh, help decide how to allocate $21 million in federal disaster relief for areas uh, in the state that were impacted. And it's just, I wouldn't call it discretionary money left up to the states, but there's a wide latitude of uh, funding possibilities. So that hearing is going to be June 5th at the Latches Theater. And uh, folks who have unmet needs should uh, at least submit written testimony and uh, then there might be a category opened up that would allow for helping to fund those uh, revenues or uh, losses that have not otherwise been covered by uh, either private or federal insurance. Tropical Storm Irene is just one of two uh, issues that people are dealing with here in the southeast Vermont area. The other is uncertainty and trying to find a way to move forward when, uh, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's 20 years down the line when the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant closes. What has been done and what's being done on that score? Okay. Well, last year, 2011, uh, Senator Galbraith joined my committee. It was his uh, first year in the Vermont Senate. And the very first day of the year, January 2011, he said, look, we've uh, got to get down to Brattleboro and focus state attention, state resources on the future of uh, the economy in Wyndham County. Uh, at that time, the Vermont Senate had voted uh, 26 to 4 in favor of essentially closing Vermont Yankee. You'll recall there needed to be legislative authorization for the Public Service Board to move forward a decision. That bill was rejected on a 26 to 4 vote. I was one of the 26 votes. Uh, and, and there were a lot of reasons for it. I mean, Entergy uh, was not a good corporate neighbor at that time. They were trying to form a spin-off corporation uh, known as Enexus, which would have been a shell corporation that would have owned this aging reactor with no assets, which we thought would essentially mean that if and when it shut down, uh, the, the burden, the financial burden would be on the state, the residents of Wyndham County with nothing by the way of assets to secure either decommissioning or dismantling the plant and so on. So in any event, 26 to 4 is a fairly strong vote. It's a bipartisan vote. And so Senator Galbraith said, okay, well, you know, folks down my way, uh, by and large, do not want Vermont Yankee to continue, by and large. I mean, there are some people who do support it. He also said that it was a state decision to not relicense Vermont Yankee and therefore it recommended that we come down and hold uh, the first of uh, other hearings uh, to discuss the post-Vermont Yankee economy, regional economy. So we came down last year in March. As a result of that, we came up with a $50,000 appropriation which uh, went to SEVITS, the Southern uh, Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategy. And that was uh, hosted by the uh, Greater uh, Brattleboro Development Corporation, and they came up with their initial plan. This year, we came down again on March 30, uh, heard a presentation. We appropriated an additional $50,000 uh, to SEVITS to continue planning the future of the economy of this region 
if and when Vermont Yankee closes, and it's not a question of if, it will close at some point. Uh, some suggest it should be sooner, others suggest it should be later. But nonetheless, when Vermont Yankee does close, there will be a noticeable impact on the economy, and we need to be positioned so that we can transition from jobs at the plant to other economic opportunities, and that's what this effort is all about. This would be similar to or greater than an effort that would be put forth if uh, IBM officials ever got in front of the TV cameras and said, we're leaving Vermont. Right, well IBM is the big gorilla, at least in northern Vermont. 5,400 jobs direct, and then uh, a couple of thousand jobs, uh, which are the, the contractors that revolve around the plant. They also host, uh, at the present time, because the size of IBM has actually shrunk in Essex, they lease space to other corporations. But when IBM speaks, people listen. Uh, I, would, I would say that uh, the response probably would be more significant. And uh, it, it, I think that's just a fact of life. I'm not sure it's fair, but uh, we have done the best we can with the limited resources that we could muster to at least start the discussion down here. Now, Senator Galbraith is on the committee. He's pushed as hard as he can. Senator White serves in the Senate, Jeanette White. She's been supportive. And I, I sense there's a great deal of energy in this part of the state. And folks are looking for an opportunity to in, it not only increase or better their lot in life, but also re, to, to, to improve the regional economy. There is, a, a, I sense a lot of energy just ready to go forward. Sometimes they need a helping hand and uh, the imprimatur of the state. And I'm hoping that uh, it moves in that direction here sooner rather than later. It's interesting. You have a twofold issue, both uh, potential job loss and secondly, the fact that Velco has spent millions of dollars on the transmission system and a new substation at that site. What do you do? You don't let that go to waste, do you? Well, I actually brought that up at the hearing in March of 2011. You know, what do we do with the infrastructure at that site? And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what, pe some people want nothing there. They simply want to return to a greenfield. And uh, others think that there are other opportunities, other generating technologies, other generating capacities. And I think the study, the SEVIT study, is going to look at what you do with that infrastructure that remains in place. I don't have the answer, but I know that that's something which uh, might be another opportunity. Speaking as somebody who was going to elementary school when the reactor dome was put on that building, looking at it across the road from Vernon Elementary growing up, uh, there, there's, there are questions and uh, you have to wonder what the, the next generation of use for those lines are going to be. Right. Well, I hate to see them just uh, stop being used. Uh, you know, natural gas right now is relatively inexpensive. I mean, maybe a, 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 a natural gas plant. I mean, I just don't have the expertise to answer that question. But it's, uh, it's something that should not simply be left to either be dismantled or uh, to just uh, deteriorate. Now, while I have you here, I would be remiss to not ask about the fact that maybe a month or so ago you uh, uh, were down in the Brattleboro area discussing the possibility of a statewide election. How does that sit right now? Is it something you're still pursuing? Well, I'm still thinking about it. You know, I'm from the Northeast Kingdom. I'm, I'm an, a Republican. I hate to say that word. Uh, but to some folks in Wyndham County, that's, uh, that's not a good uh, letter to have after your name. But nonetheless, I've really been an independent Republican, really like George Aiken was and uh, Jim Jeffords. And as folks uh, who I've interacted with here in Wyndham County over the years, dating back to the 90s when we you know, worked on the latches, when we worked to uh, acquire the property, which is now the Gibson River Garden, and engaged in other you know, economic development initiatives here, uh, I've really been a fairly independent person and have always looked at the issues as opposed to the name after a person, the letter after a person's name. So I'm still thinking about it, but, you know, being from the Northeast Kingdom, which uh, if you folks think you're forgotten in 
south uh, eastern Vermont, you, you can certainly sense how people feel in my part of the state. So it's a rural area, uh, Republican. Uh, it's, uh, you have to weigh those realities. And, uh, but I'm still thinking about it and uh, have been encouraged by some great people around the state who I've worked with over the last 32 years. So we'll make a decision in the next couple of weeks and then uh, let the chips uh, fall where they may. Obviously it sounds like no matter what you decide, you're going to be an active force in the state of Vermont and not just the Northeast Kingdom. Well, I think I have been active around the state. I mean, I, when I was chairman of the Institutions Committee, we did a number of projects around the state and got to meet some really great people. You know, it's those folks who really volunteer their time and their energy on community projects that sort of rise to the surface. And I have been really fortunate to meet some of the real leaders of this state. And I don't mean just government, I'm talking about folks who have stepped up to the plate to help their community, help their schools, help their municipalities. So it's that, those contacts and the experience I've developed over 32 years that I'd like to continue to use in some fashion uh, maybe not serving as a state senator from the Northeast Kingdom, but rather in a statewide office. But again, it's a daunting uh, task. It's a, a significant decision, and uh, I'm going to have to make it in the next couple of weeks. Well, whatever role you decide to play, we'll look forward to hearing about it with, uh, with ears and eyes on. Well, thank you very much, Tim, and again, thanks for your work down here. You've been a real pillar uh, as far as informing people and your work uh, following Tropical Storm Irene did not go unnoticed and that's why we uh, passed the Joint House Senate Resolution recognizing your work and the work of your radio station. Thank you, very much appreciated. Again, our guest is State Senator Vincent DeLuzzi in Brattleboro to make a couple of announcements related to Tropical Storm Irene and a mobile home park bill. This is Tim Johnson. No matter what you do, you can make a difference. Think about it and take action today. Thanks for watching.